We'll put out your, uh, your outline today. We're going to continue in the sermon series that uh, we started a couple of weeks ago about the Middle East invasion, uh, written up by uh, the prophet Ezekiel. Some 600 B.C. Uh, is when Ezekiel ministered to Israel as a prophet. And, of course, that was during the exile when they were taken off into exile to Babylon. And then, of course, after 70 years, they came back and, and uh, rebuilt the temple and all of that. And so we're going to be talking about the temple of the Lord this morning. Uh, we saw in the first message how Israel has been regathered as a nation, which is a fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy that they would come back from many nations and be gathered together and once again be in their land. And of course that took place in 1948 when they became a state again. And last Sunday we talked about the invasion from Ezekiel chapter 38 where uh, many of the Islamic uh, nations are going to join up with uh, Magog, which most likely is Russia, and come down against Israel in the latter days. And I think that's something that could happen very, very soon. And so this morning we're going to continue with, uh, with this, and we'll be looking uh, in Ezekiel in just a moment, but uh, we'll look at a few other passages before that. The first one is in Isaiah chapter 2, in verse 2, where the prophet Isaiah also gave a prophecy about the end times and about the temple being rebuilt, about 700 B.C. In uh, verse 2, uh, Isaiah said, In the last days the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains, it will be raised above, above the hills, and nations will stream to it. And so we know the temple is going to be rebuilt. Now this particular temple, I believe, is a reference to the millennial temple. And we're going to take a closer look at that here in, in just a moment. But um, the temple, we know, is going to be rebuilt. The Bible is very clear about that. And there's a lot of interest in that today, of course. A lot of excitement about the temple possibly being rebuilt before too long. Let's take a quick look here at a few future events on God's prophetic timetable. Kind of get a little perspective uh, to go along with the message this morning. Some future events on God's timetable. The first one I think that's uh, most likely going to happen next is the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church. Now we're not exactly sure about the timing of some of these things. Uh, the evasion we, we uh, talked about last week could happen before or after the rapture. We're not sure. But I'm speculating here that it might perhaps happen you know, before the invasion, the rapture of the church. And so that's an exciting topic. A lot of folks are interested in the prophecy and in the rapture of the church and all of that. And it creates a lot of interest. Uh, I've shared with you that uh, I wonder and speculate that perhaps the rapture will occur during the, the Feast of Trumpets. Now, I'm not giving you a year. We can't pick a date, of course. But uh, it makes sense to me that since Jesus fulfilled the, the spring festivals in his first coming when he went to the cross, that uh, those fall festivals, the time of year that we're in right now, uh, would be the time when uh, he might perhaps return. And uh, those uh, prophecies would be fulfilled exactly as well. And I shared with you last uh, Sunday, if you remember, that the Feast of Trumpets is a two-day observance. It begins with a, with a new moon. And so there's just the slightest little crescent on a new moon, and that would be the beginning of, of the new moon, and that was the date, of course, that they would pick uh, the first month of the, uh, the calendar, of the civil calendar among the Jews, uh, that would be when that, that would begin their year, and that was Rosh Hashanah, and that happens to be today, right now, is Rosh Hashanah. Isn't that interesting? And so that's when the, the Feast of Trumpets was observed, and since it had to begin with the, the new moon, they wanted to be precise. And so they said, well, we're not exactly sure when that's going to happen. You know, back then they couldn't do that. And so they made it a two-day observance. And so it's today and tomorrow is the observance of the Feast of Trumpets. And so it's very interesting. You know, Jesus said, you know, we don't know the day or the hour of his return. And we certainly can't know that. But there was a, a Hebrew idiom, you know, that says we don't know the day or the hour. And so everybody knew what Jesus meant when he said that. And so could it be either today or tomorrow? We don't know. And so could it be that it will be during the Feast of Trumpets at some time, whether it's this year, next year, or whenever it may be? Wouldn't it be exciting if it happened this morning during my sermon? Wouldn't that be great? Uh, don't, I, I didn't hear a big hearty amen for that. But uh, 
Uh, you know, the rapture always fascinates me. One, one year, uh, we were talking about this a few years ago when the blood moons, you know, and all that, and everybody was convinced it was about to happen, and I was really excited about it. And Charlotte and I were talking about it one day at home, you know, and, and then she went into the bathroom to take a bath or something. I had a little bit of time. And so on my recliner, I stretched out some clothes, you know, got some of my clothes and my shoes and everything. And I, put, I think I put my ring up on the uh, armrest of the recliner and all of that. And uh, when I could tell that she was about to come out, I went and hid in the closet. And uh, we'd just been talking about the rapture of the church. And uh, I got kind of a strange response from her. I could hear her yell, you jerk, you jerk, <laughs> when she came out. I didn't expect that, you know. And uh, anyway, she knew right away it was a, it was a hoax. And uh, she said, I knew it was not the rapture when I saw our dog sitting there on the, you know, on the floor. I knew it was not the rapture, you know. So I might get left behind, but the dog's going. So. Anyway, it's fun to think about when it might happen. The rapture of the church, if it happens during the Feast of Trumpets, uh, would make sense because the Bible teaches us. You know, Paul said, uh, you know, when the Lord comes back at the rapture of the church, that the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And it also tells us that when that happens that there will be the voice of the archangel and the trumpet blast of God. And so it makes sense to me that perhaps during the Feast of Trumpets, during one of those two days, perhaps that will be the time that the Lord Jesus Christ comes back for his church. And we believe probably that archangel most likely is Gabriel. Gabriel, blow your horn. You know, I'm anxious to go. I know many of you are anxious to go. But it could be that we still have a lot of work to do before the Lord is ready for us to go and be with him. So we can't say definitively, of course, when that's going to happen. When I was in uh, high school, I went to Caprock, and I remember at the football games, there were some guys that had one of these big old tanks, you know, big old tank, and it had a truck horn on the top of it. And every time the, the uh, Caprock Longhorns would score a touchdown, which wasn't very often, you know, they would, uh, they would sound this big old horn, you know, big old truck horn. It was, it was unbelievable. I, you know, the Feast of Trumpets began about 30 minutes ago in Israel. It begins at sundown. And so about 30 minutes ago, 6.29 p.m., which was 10.29 a.m. our time, that's when it began. I thought about having us count it down in here, you know, just count it down for grins, and then have somebody in the back room with one of those truck horns, you know, and just sound that thing off and see what you would do. But I was afraid somebody might have a heart attack, so I, I thought better of that. But I think the rapture of the church could happen very, very soon. Now imagine what's going to happen when that occurs. The mass confusion in the world. I mentioned last Sunday, I believe it was, that... When that happens, I think the United States will be affected more than any other country on the planet because we have so many Christians in our country that will be removed at the rapture of the church. And so there's going to be mass confusion and there's going to be a, a power vacuum that will need to be filled by some charismatic leader. And I think that paves the way for the next thing on the list there. That's the arrival of the Antichrist. That perhaps uh, soon after the rapture of the church, this, uh, this man is going to come forward, and he's going to appear to have all the answers to everybody's questions about what has happened. He's going to be a dynamic speaker, a dynamic leader. People will be mesmerized when he gives a press conference and things like that. And so it makes sense to me that when something like the rapture of the church occurs, that that would really pave the way for this man to come forward. And then the third thing here on the list is the invasion against Israel. Now again, the, the, the timing here may not, not be exact. It may be that this would happen before the rapture. But I think that the rapture of the church and this invasion against Israel by Russia and these Islamic allies is going to happen before the seven-year tribulation. Last week we saw how Israel will have great victory over this enemy. God will give them victory. And they're going to burn the weapons for how long? Seven years. Seems to me like that's a correlation there with the seven-year tribulation time. I believe the rapture of the church is going to happen about seven years, you know, uh, prior to the second coming of Christ, at the very beginning of the uh, tribulation time. And I won't go into all of that, why I believe that this morning, but I believe that that seven-year seven number is very, very significant. And so it could be that these two things may happen somewhat close together. And perhaps if the... Uh, if the rapture of the church is going to happen during the Feast of Trumpets, last Sunday I shared with you the, the speculation again that perhaps the, um, the invasion 
against Israel might happen during Hanukkah, which is in December, just prior to Christmas time this year, December 22nd, I believe. And last week we, we looked at that and talked about that, the significant events that have happened on that particular date in Israel's history. Uh, in, in Haggai, we're given some information that God is going to shake the earth and, and He's going to cause the enemy of Israel to fight against themselves. And it seems to indicate that it's going to be on that very day. And other significant events have happened in Israel's history on that very day, on the 24th day of Kislev, which is the day before Hanukkah. And so, who knows? Again, we can't be definitive about these things, but it's interesting to wonder about and to speculate. And if both of these things happen that close together, one in September, one in December, that would be, you know, prior to the seven-year tribulation time and I think would fit very nicely into prophetic scripture. After the invasion here, I have the seven-year treaty with Israel. We know that this Antichrist is going to establish a seven-year uh, peace covenant with the nation of Israel. And you can imagine if you've got the rapture of the church and then you have this amazing invasion against Israel, and suddenly th this enemy is completely wiped out by the Lord, well, that would be an ideal time, of course, for a peace treaty to be established. And so I think that perhaps that's what is going to happen. It's very interesting to speculate and to wonder exactly how these things are going to come about. And so the, the, the fifth thing there is the rebuilding of the temple. The rebuilding of the temple. We know that the temple is going to be rebuilt perhaps during the first three and a half year period because it must be there at the midway point of the seven year tribulation time. Also, there's a lot of interest in the rebuilding of the temple among many, many people today. Now, much of Israel today, over in Israel, is very secular. A lot of folks are surprised to hear that. Probably only about 10% of the population of, of Israel today is, is really religious. But there's still a lot of interest, and there are groups that are working you know, to, to see this come about, the rebuilding of the temple. After the Six-Day War, uh, there was a group called the, the Temple Mount Faithful, that emerged, and they tried to set the cornerstone of the temple up on the Temple Mount. You know, they were stopped from doing that, but they've attempted to do that, I believe, a couple of times. Of course, it causes a lot of anxiety among the Muslim people when anything like that occurs. Uh, another group came along in 1987 uh, that is called the, the Temple Institute, the Temple Institute. And there's a, a, a place over there in the old city of Jerusalem where you can visit and take a tour. And these folks have tried to, to recreate the, the instruments and the clothing and all that stuff that they use, that the priests would use in the temple. All the, you know, the utensils and everything. And so it's very interesting. They're, they're very serious about this. And they're, they're working hard to have everything ready to go so that when the time comes, you know, they can begin to use the temple once again up on the, the Temple Mount. Last year, I had the privilege of going to Israel, and it was during their 70th anniversary uh, of being born again as a nation in 1948. There was a lot of celebration, a lot of excitement, and uh, I went over to a place uh, called the Mikdash, Mikdash Educational Center, and I'd seen this on the internet, and uh, Mikdash means sanctuary. It has to do with the temple. They're very, very interested in the temple being rebuilt, and they have these commemorative coins, and I bought one, and it's a temple coin, and they say that part of the money that you give for this commemorative coin, they want to use that to try and, and rebuild the temple. And so lots of enthusiasm, lots of folks are interested in the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. And I, I believe that that also could happen very, very soon. You can imagine after the rapture of the church and this invasion against Israel that's foiled by the Lord and, and all these things that are happening in the world, the turmoil and everything, you can imagine how this could all come to pass as a part of this seven-year treaty the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. And so it all makes sense to me. You know, I don't understand folks that try to symbolize all of this. You know, there are all millennialists that don't believe in a literal millennium. There are those that believe that the, the seven-year tribulation time is just symbolic of evil in the world and all of that. Uh, there are those that don't th take these things literally. It makes so much sense to me to be literal, doesn't it to you? I mean, it just makes so much sense. In fact, it, it seems to me that you kind of strain the text if you try to you try to allegorize these things because a literal interpretation to me is what makes more sense than anything at all. And so we're going to look here this morning at the, at primarily at the temple. 
Let's talk about the past history of, of Israel's temple. Remember, the first temple was the Temple of Solomon, and that was built about 960 B.C. Solomon was given that privilege of building a temple. David wanted to do it, his father, but God said, no, you're a man of blood, and so we're going to let your son build the temple, and that, of course, was Solomon. And then the second uh, temple was the Temple of Zerubbabel. Remember, in, in 586 B.C., the Babylonians came in and destroyed Solomon's temple. And then after 70 years of exile, they came back and were allowed to rebuild the temple. And so this was the second temple, the temple uh, that they were rebuilding under the leadership of Zerubbabel. And so that was at about 516 B.C. when it was dedicated, which was exactly 70 years after it had been destroyed. And then in 19 B.C., there was a remodel of the temple by Herod the Great. Herod the Great did a remodel. Now, the temple was not destroyed and rebuilt. It was simply a massive remodel. And so the temple of Zerubbabel and the remodel by Herod the Great really are considered to be a part of the second temple period. Sometimes that's confusing. You say, well, wasn't that the third temple? No, that was still the second temple. It was just a massive remodel. Herod the Great was an amazing builder, and he's done you know, there are many things in Israel today that still exist from 2,000 years ago that he was instrumental in building. And one of them is the Temple Mount. It's like a 35-acre in size structure. It's got like three levels with arch supports underneath, and it's just incredible, incredible engineering. And so it's still standing to this day. And the massive stones that are around there, of course, many of those have been rebuilt, over the years, but, but some of the actual Herodian stones are still there. You can see them. They've got a border around them, kind of like a picture frame. And those date all the way back to the time of Christ. And so Herod the Great did this incredible you know, remodel and rebuilding of, of the temple. And uh, what's interesting about that is it took about 83 years for this to occur. It began in 19 B.C. and went on until 64 A.D., just six years before the Romans came in and destroyed it. Isn't that something? Just six years after it was completed, after an 83-year-long project, the Romans came in and, and destroyed the temple, and many of the structures up on top of the Temple Mount, they threw down these massive stones, are still there today. Piles of stones are still visible today down at the base, the western base of the Temple Mount. And so the Romans did that in 70 A.D. So that gives you a little bit of background about the past history of Israel's temple. Now this morning I really want to focus on the, the two future temples, okay? The two future temples uh, that are yet to come. And the first one is the Tribulation Temple. The Tribulation Temple. And this, of course, is the one that I think is going to happen uh, after the rapture of the church and the Antichrist establishes this peace covenant with Israel. I think a part of that covenant is going to be the rebuilding of the temple. And I think he will convince the Jews and the Palestinians to go along with this. The, the Muslim world will somehow accept this. It's going to be an amazing achievement because this man is being controlled completely by Satan himself. And he's going to be a great, great deceiver. And somehow is going to be able to convince these, these two enemies to go along with this. I've for some time believed that the temple will be built next to the Dome of the Rock. A lot of folks are skeptical about that, say, no, the Dome of the Rock's going to have to be removed. I don't think so. I think it's going to remain, and I think the temple will be just north of that. In fact, there are many that have done research that believe that may be where it was originally. We don't know for sure. But I think that would be a great sign of, of, uh, of cooperation between the, the Muslim people and the Jewish people if the Dome of the Rock and the Temple are side by side up on top of that, that Temple Mount platform. And so I believe that that's what's going to happen. Now in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, we're told about this, this uh, covenant between the Antichrist and the Jewish people. It says, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. And, and through the context, we know that's a seven year period of time. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. Now, that's going to kick off the, the great tribulation time, that latter three-and-a-half-year period of the seven-year tribulation era. And Jesus said it's a time of, of great, great distress and great, great tribulation. 
In fact, Jesus said, unless it were stopped by the Lord himself, that, that you know, the whole world would be destroyed. But the Lord is going to come back and put a stop to that. And that, of course, will take place during the battle of Armageddon. People have speculated about what this abomination is. We know there's some kind of an image that's being set up. Some think it's a statue or something like that. I've wondered if it might not be television. Television monitors of the Antichrist giving a speech, you know, up on the Temple Mount for the whole world to see. And there's television monitors everywhere. Now we've got these big, huge screens, you know, that have the projected image and all of that. Could it be something like that? A an image of the Antichrist. And the whole world, the whole world is mesmerized by the message that he's giving when this, uh, this temple perhaps is, is, I guess, perhaps being dedicated. We're told in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, that he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And so the Antichrist at that time will proclaim himself to be God himself. And that's when this terrible, terrible time of distress is going to come upon the earth. Isn't that amazing? And so we could be very, very close to the rebuilding of the temple and all these things being fulfilled. So that's the, the tribulation temple. But now there's a, another temple that will follow that, and that's the millennial temple. And this is different. It's very different, as we'll see here in just a moment. This is not the tribulation temple. Uh, that's going to be defiled by the Antichrist. And when Christ comes back, I think it's going to be done away with by the Lord himself. And a, a millennial temple is going to be actually brought into existence by the Lord himself in a supernatural way. In Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 26, God says, I will make a covenant of peace with them, an everlasting covenant. I'll give them their land and multiply them, and I will put my temple among them forever. In other words, it's going to be there throughout the entire millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, of course, we don't even have a temple yet, so this is something that's yet to come. But I think that this is distinct and different from the tribulation temple. And we're going to see the differences here in, in just a moment as we take a closer look at this. There are several details I want to mention this morning from Ezekiel that show us that this particular temple is very, very different from any other temple that's ever existed. It's very different from the, the tribulation temple as well. First of all, the temple will have a throne room. There's going to be a throne room. Now we know that the previous temples, of course, had the Holy of Holies. And the Ark of the Covenant was kept in the Holy of Holies, in Solomon's temple. And then, of course, we don't know anything about it after that. It turns up missing. And so um, we're not sure what happened to the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Some believe that it's still in existence today. You know, there's all kinds of theories about that. And so I'm, I'm wondering if that will not somehow be revealed when this temple is established by the Lord, and if the Ark of the Covenant will not be brought forward at that time and be used really as a throne by the Lord Jesus Christ. It makes a lot of sense to me. Remember uh, in, in the Old Testament, the Bible tells us that when they had the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, and the high priest went in there on the Day of Atonement, that the, the glory of the Lord, called the Shekinah, Shekinah means that which dwells. The glory of the Lord would appear between the cherubim, the angels, that had their wings outstretched on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And so that must have been an incredible sight to behold, a supernatural sight for the high priest to experience. But the presence of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, would appear above the Ark of the Covenant. And I just wonder, you know, will that be used as a throne by the Lord Jesus Christ when, that, when this particular temple is established? Again, it, it makes sense to me that that could possibly take place. Ezekiel 43 and verse 6, uh, uh, Ezekiel says, I heard someone speaking to me from inside the temple. And he said, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place for the soles of my feet. This is where I will live among the Israelites forever. And so we're told that uh, this is going to become a throne room for the Lord Jesus Christ during the millennial reign of the Lord. And so this temple obviously is different from others. One difference that I don't have in your outline 
is we're told in chapter 41 that there are double doors instead of a veil. Remember there was a veil in the previous temples? In fact, when Jesus died on the cross, he cried out with a loud voice, the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. Remember that? So there's this huge thick veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. This temple has double doors. It's, it's very different. The dimensions are different. Uh, everything that you look at with this particular temple in Ezekiel is very different than any temple that's ever existed. And so this is something that is yet to come. Also, we're told that there's going to be a return to sacrifices. The sacrifices, animal sacrifices will resume. In Ezekiel chapter 34, we're told about the prince, that a prince will reign on behalf of the Lord uh, during the millennium. And it even gives him a name. It's David. David the prince, we're told, will reign. Now, a lot of folks have tried to speculate, well, that can't be true. That's got to be Jesus. You know, we know that Jesus is going to reign. Well, certainly he will, but I think he's going to have David uh, uh, serving on his behalf as a representative for him. And because we're told specifically that David, and he's called the prince, that the prince is going to reign from Jerusalem during this millennial period. Now, Jesus, of course, is king, but David is representing him. We know that this could not be Jesus because we're told that uh, in chapter 45 that David here, the prince, offers sacrifices for his own sin. Well, Jesus, of course, has no sin, so we know that this could not be a reference to Christ. It has to be a reference to someone else, and we're told that it's David. So I believe that King David is going to reign once again. God is going to give him that great blessing to do that because of his faithfulness to the Lord. And so we're told here in Ezekiel 45, 17, that it would be the duty of the prince to provide the burnt offerings, grain offerings, and drink offerings uh, at the festivals. And so the festivals will resume, and you're going to have the animal sacrifices and all of that. Now, folks have said, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would there be animal sacrifices during the millennium? You know, Jesus fulfilled all of that, right? He is the Lamb of God. He's the ultimate sacrifice, of course, a sacrifice for our sins. And so why would there be a resumption of these animal sacrifices? Well, I think it's going to be a memorial where we look back on what Christ did. Just as in the Old Testament, you know, they had these sacrifices. If they were looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, I think that these will be looking back in the, in the way of a memorial. And so these sacrifices, these animal sacrifices are going to resume. And I've shared with you, I believe that Jesus will make periodic appearances and uh, come out of the temple and everything. And the whole world will, will witness this and be amazed by this. Uh, we know during the Feast of Tabernacles, he's going to, to be there and make appearances because all the nations are to come and to send representatives to worship him during that time. The Bible tells us that uh, in Zechariah. And so we know that these things are going to occur. And then finally, we're told that living water will flow from the temple. Living water. You say, well, what is living water? Well, in the Bible, living water is water that gives life, but generally it refers to moving water, water that is moving. But there's some symbolism here in that it, it's water that gives life. Now notice this, in chapter 47 of Ezekiel, verse 1, Ezekiel says, I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. And he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah where it enters the sea. And when it empties into the sea, the water there becomes fresh. And so the Arabah is the area of the Dead Sea. And so we're told that water is going to flow from the threshold of the temple. It's going to flow probably through the Kidron Valley, which extends all the way down to the Dead Sea. Water is going to empty into the Dead Sea and it's going to make the water fresh. You ever wondered why they call the Dead Sea the Dead Sea? Because there's nothing living in it. It's got so much salt. It's like 34% salt content. And so there are no fish in the Dead Sea. But we're told when this amazing thing happens, and this temple is there, that living water, water is going to flow from the temple... It's going to flow into the Dead Sea, and it's going to make the sea water fresh. That salt water is going to be fresh. And we're told that there are going to be fishermen that fish out of that. And everything. Isn't that incredible? 
Uh, it's really quite an experience to, uh, to go swimming in the Dead Sea. Have any of you ever done that? How many of you ever gone swimming in the Dead Sea? Man, it's really, you cannot sink, okay? It might be a good place to learn how to swim, you know, because you cannot sink. I mean, it's impossible. I tried to do it. I tried to make myself sink. You, know, you can't do it. And you've seen pictures of people, you know, stretched out, reading a newspaper and stuff, you know, and it's very much like that. I mean, it's got a really, really high salt content. Now, you can't really tell that when you're in it, you know. If you, if you feel it, it feels kind of oily. But when you get in it, it just feels like regular water, but you don't want to get it in your eyes. And you don't want to shave your legs, ladies, I hope, you know, uh, before you get in there. They always say that because it's going to burn. You know, it's got a lot of salt in it. But it's really an amazing, I mean, it's a weird sensation to get out there and you just bob up and down like a cork, you know. And uh, it's, it's hard to keep your feet down. They just want to pop up, you know. And so it's just incredible. And uh, so every time I go and I'm there, I think about that, that someday this, this water, this living water, is going to flow from the temple and into the Dead Sea, and it's going to become fresh. We're also told that water is going to flow over to the Mediterranean Sea as well from the temple. It's going to go both directions. And so Zechariah verse 14 and verse 8 says, On that day living water will flow out from Jerusalem half to the eastern sea, which is the Dead Sea, and half to the western sea, which is the Mediterranean, in summer and in winter. So it's going to flow both ways. Now, a lot of folks say, oh, that's just symbolism. Well, I could see how it's symbolic, certainly, of life coming from death. That's what happened to us, right, when we became believers. There is symbolism there, certainly, but there is absolutely no reason not to believe that this is a literal, literal thing that's going to happen. I believe very much that this is a literal thing. There's no reason to kind of explain it away, you know, uh, spiritually somehow. It just makes sense to me that it's literally going to happen. I mean, great detail is given. You can go back and read about the fishermen fishing and talks about where they fish from, from this point to this point, and how they're catching the fish and all of that. Well, that sounds pretty literal to me. And so I'm convinced that that's exactly what's going to happen. Jesus spoke about living water. In, uh, in John's Gospel, chapter 4, remember when Jesus had the encounter with the, the woman of Samaria at Jacob's well? Jesus came there and the woman brought her water pot to draw some water, water jar out of the, the well. And Jesus struck up this conversation with her and he said, uh, won't you give me something to drink? And she was shocked that he would speak to her because she's a Samaritan and she's a woman. That just didn't happen among the Jews. And so Jesus said, you know, if you knew who I was, paraphrasing here, if you knew who I was and you were to ask me, I would give you living water and you'd never be thirsty again. Well, boy, that really piqued her interest. You know, what, what do you mean living water? You mean I won't have to bring this jar up here anymore, you know, and get water? She said, oh, I'd really like to have some of that water. And that's when Jesus said, go call your husband. And she said, I don't have a husband. She said, I know you don't. You've had five husbands. And the man you're with now is not your husband. He wasn't being mean to her. He was helping her to see that she had a need, a spiritual need. She was a sinner. She needed salvation. And Jesus said, if you, if you knew who I was and you were to ask me, I would give you living water. And he said that living water would be like a, a well of water springing up within you to everlasting life talking about the Holy Spirit, talking about salvation. Boy, she wanted some of that really, really bad. And she came to believe in Christ as the Messiah. The Bible says she went into town and told everybody about Him, and they came out and talked to Him and talked Him into staying with them for several days. And many, many people came to know Christ as Savior because of her testimony about Jesus. Living water. Life coming from what was dead. That's my story. That's your story if you know Christ as your Savior. The Bible says we're dead in our sins, our trespasses and sins, until we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you trust in Jesus as your personal Savior and you invite Him to come into your heart and soul to save you from your sins, that which was dead is now alive. You've been born again. You've become a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. 
that through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we have everlasting life. That's something to be excited about, isn't it? Prophecy really excites me. You know, I, I'm convinced that these things perhaps are going to happen very soon. Now, I'm not a date setter. We can't do that, of course. But I get excited when I think about these things. And with the events going on in the world today, especially the situation going on right now with Iran and Russia and everything that's going on in the Middle East, boy, it just makes you wonder, is this it? Is this getting close? Are all of these events about to take place? And so we need to be prepared. We need to be ready. We need to be sharing the gospel. As Brother Darrell said, we need to be spreading the word of God while there is still time so that people might be saved. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand and pray.